Chapter 7. Chapter 7. All right, so we've studied quadratics. We've studied linear, x to the first. We've studied quadratics, which is x to the second. And now in this section, we're going to study x to the third, which are called cubic functions. X to the third because uh, it's the next one after two. It's the next integer after two. So it's the parent function that looks like that. But we call them cubic functions. And the reason we call them cubics, any, 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 any idea why we call y equals x cubed a cubic function? Well, let's think of what a cube would look like. A cube would look something like this, right? And the sides, what do we know about the side lengths on a cube? They're the same. So if I don't know what the side length is, I'll call the width x, I'll call the height x, and I'll call the depth x. What would the volume then of this cube be? Added? Length times width times height, which is what? X to the third. So that's why we call them the cubic. X cubed is your cubic function because it gives you the volume of a cube. That's x by x by x, okay? Now, the general form, it says standard form. This is also the general form. I use them interchangeably. The general form is the same in this case as the standard form. Uh, and it's ax, well, let's just, let's not even put another term up there. Let's just call it standard form. The standard form is, uh, of a quadratic is ax squared plus bx plus c. We write them in descending order, okay? Standard form means descending order of degree. So the x squared goes first because it's the largest exponent. The linear term, x to the first, goes second. And the constant, which has no x, goes third. It's the same for the standard form of a cubic function. There's just an extra term now. So we're going to have to reallocate our a, b, c's, and d's. So it's ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. We can use the alphabet endlessly to represent the coefficients as long as we write them in alphabetical order starting with the leading term. So ax cubed is the leading term. The parent function for all cubics of that form is the simple function f of x equals x cubed. In other words, every single cubic function that has more terms or that doesn't look like x cubed can be obtained through a transformation of x cubed, okay? Simply by adding more terms. A squared term, a linear term, and a constant, they all affect the graph differently. Here's what we're gonna focus on today. We're gonna focus on the parent function of x cubed, okay? So here's what the graph of x cubed looks like. You can see the number line or the t-table over here on the left, the t-table. In the left column, you have your independent variable x, which you could choose to be anything. And in the right column, you have your dependent variable y. So when x is negative 2, what's the output? What's negative 2 cubed? Not 8, but negative 8. Right. When you cube a negative number, you have three negative factors. So a negative times a negative is a positive, And then that positive times that third negative makes it negative again. So if you plot that point, you get negative 2. Uh, negative 8. So the scale here is neg negative 1, negative 2, negative 2, negative 8 down here. Uh, 0 cubed is 0, 1 cubed is 1, 2 cubed is 8. So you notice there's some symmetry going on here, isn't there? Negative 1 cubed is the opposite of positive 1 cubed. Negative 2 cubed is the opposite of positive 2 cubed. We say that this function is an odd function. I'll jump to that right there. We say it's an odd function because it has origin symmetry, okay, origin symmetry. What is origin symmetry from the graph? Well, from the table, of course, you can see the symmetry in the negative inputs and the positive inputs. They have opposite outputs. But graphically, the origin symmetry is called rotational symmetry. If you put your finger down at the origin and you spin this graph 180 degrees, it'll look identical. You can do that on your iPad by turning your iPad upside down 180 degrees. As long as it's on screen lock, you'll see the same x cubed function. It looks pretty much the exact same. So that's, that's what we call an odd function. It has origin symmetry, which is rotational symmetry. The easy way to remember x cubed, or the way I always remember it, is I, I call this the disco graph. If y'all if y'all know the Saturday Night Live or Saturday Night Fever, have you ever done that? Yeah, it looks like John Travolta. He's got his arm up here on the right. And it's down here on the left, and he's doing he's doing that kind of dance right there. So I always think of X cubed as being the disco graph, and I always picture John Travolta. They have a cool Christmas commercial with John Travolta now. He's dressed up like Santa, and he kind of relives some of the Saturday Night Fever stuff in his Santa suit. It's pretty cool. 
But the original Saturday Night Fever, the cover looked like that. And it looks just like the X Cube graph. So that's how I always remember it. X Cube is the disco graph. All right, what are some other attributes or characteristics of the cubic parent function? Well, let's go down the table here. Um, first of all, the domain is negative infinity to infinity, which means the domain is what? All real numbers. So there it is in interval, there it is in set. Remember, I also allow you to say or just double bar R, either one. Now, here's what's cool about the range. Parabolas were always bounded above or below by wherever the vertex was. But cubic functions, they go on to infinity in both directions, up to positive infinity, in this case on the right, and down to negative infinity on the left. So their range is also all real numbers, all day long, all day long. Now, the vertex, there's not really a vertex per se like there is for a parabola, which was a local min or a local max. We still call this the vertex, but it's also called the inflection point. Okay, it's at zero, zero. This is where the curvature changes. Okay, so we're going to track that point. That is, that is like the vertex on a parabola. When we start doing transformations of this, I want to know where the inflection point goes because that's where the graph in this case goes from, we say, concave down or curving downward, like a frown. See how it's like part of a frown over here to the left? And on the right side, we say it's concave up like a cup. It holds water or it's part of a smile. So in this case, it goes from a frown to a smile. The curvature thing of is a smile or a frown. Let's go ahead and say that the curvature changes from a frown to smile. It changes from a frown to a smile, or part of a frown to part of a smile. Again, if it's a frown, we say it's concave down. I'm going to write that underneath here. This is concave down. Like a frown, it rhymes. And a smile is concave up. We measure the curvature of the graph using concavity. We don't say concave and convex. In your science class, you may use concave and convex, but that's all in relation to where the observer is. We're all observing this from the same perspective. So we're gonna say concave down if it's part of a frown, and concave up if it's part of a smile. Okay, um, now let's look at the end behavior. We already kind of mentioned this when we looked at the range, but the right end behavior, as x goes to positive infinity, what do the y values do? They also go to infinity. In other words, as we go to the right, the graph ends up going up forever and ever and ever. And what's the left end behavior? As x goes to negative infinity, the left end behavior, what do the y values do as we go down to the left? They go down to negative infinity. So they go down. It exits right up, and it, and it enters bottom down. That's what that means. And remember, that's how we write that. We say as x arrow infinity, the arrow means approaches, comma, the y values or the function values, f of x, approaches arrow infinity. Remember, the arrow means approaches. The arrow means approaches. We can't ever get to infinity, can we? We can only approach it. Yeah. My calories consumed over the Thanksgiving holidays only approached infinity. It didn't equal infinity. Thank goodness. All right. Over what intervals is this graph increasing? Well, if you look at the graph from left to right, we read a graph from least to greatest like we read a book from left to right. This graph appears to be going uphill the whole time, isn't it? It's up, it comes in going uphill. There's a stationary point right there at the origin. We call that a stationary point in calculus because technically at that point, it's neither going uphill nor downhill. It's a single moment in time where it's horizontal there, but it only lasts for a single point and then it's increasing again to the right. So we can say that this function is increasing through that point. So we say it's increasing. We should add something in front of the negative infinity to infinity. What should we add in front of there? Since we're used to the notation now, we should add a x epsilon. That means on the x interval from 
negative infinity to positive infinity from left to right. So we say then, because it's never decreasing, it's never decreasing, we say that this one is monotonic increasing. What do you think monotonic means? One. Like monocera, y'all heard of the monoceras? They have a strict rule on the monoceras that there can only be one Sarah on the dance team at a time. Monocera, one Sarah. Okay? If there's two Sarahs trying out, sorry, we're the monoceras. One Sarah is not getting in. Monotonic means one tone and one tone only. And that means what is it doing, increasing or decreasing? It's only increasing. It's never decreasing. No, actually, Sarah is not spelled the same way as the name Sarah. C-E-R-A, I think, comes from the Latin word for horn. corn, for horn. Very good. All right. Does it have a maximum Y value? Is there a maximum Y value on here if it goes up to infinity? None. Does it have a minimum Y value? None. It has no minimum Y value. Uh-uh. And then we already said that this function is what? Even or odd? It's an odd function because we say it has origin symmetry. Origin symmetry, which is the rotational symmetry. Let's go ahead and say something else about origin symmetry. Opposite inputs give opposite outputs. I want you all to be aware of that. That's something different that I'm making y'all be aware of than the other Algebra 2 classes. That's the advantage y'all have for having me, who also teaches Honors Free Cal, who also teaches BC Calculus. I'm getting you to think about things that other classes aren't. I'm getting you to start doing notation like X epsilon. I'm training you, essentially, for the big leagues, which is what you want. Opposite inputs yield opposite outputs. That's what makes this function an odd function. Okay, it has origin symmetry. Okay, so now the standard transformation form or the transformation form. You could say transformation function or transformation form, whatever you want to call it. It's going to be this. We're going to take our cubic function and we're going to do the same things to this cubic function. I can zoom out here if you want so you can get example one and two in there and take a picture of that. We're going to do the same thing to this cubic function that we did for the quadratic functions. Namely, we're going to reflect them across the X axis, possibly. We're going to vertically stretch or compress them. We're going to shift them left or right, and we're going to shift them up or down. We're not going to horizontally compress or stretch, and we're not going to reflect them across the Y axis. So here's what it looks like in standard transformation form. The negative in front is going to be your X axis reflection, just like it was for a, a quadratic, okay? Your A is your vertical dilation factor. And it's gonna be exactly as it appears. If A is two, it's gonna be vertically stretched by a factor of two. If A is a half, it's vertically compressed by a factor of two, just like it was for a quadratic. Now, instead of using B and C, we're using H and K again, because HK is important. H is gonna be your horizontal shift. Horizontal shift. And remember, it's the opposite of what it appears. And then K is your vertical shift, exactly as it appears. So A and K are exactly as it appears. Now, what's important about HK? Your inflection point is HK. Just like your vertex. On the parabola was still HK, your inflection point is still HK. But you can track it. It starts off at zero, zero. So if we move it right three up two, it's now going to be at the point three, two. All right. Y'all ready to try out the examples? Boy, hardy am I. Number one, write the function G of X if the cubic parent function is vertically compressed by a factor of three, translated horizontally five units to the left, and translated vertically two units down. 
piece of cake. So we're given a verbal description and we're writing the equation. What's the first step in writing the equation for g of x? Louder? Thank you. G of x equals. That's the easy part. It's also the easy part to lose points on. And I will take off on quizzes and on tests if you don't have g of x equals. Okay. Now, it's vertically compressed by a factor of 3. So there's no, there's no reflection going on, is there? So a is not going to be negative. It's still going to be a positive number. If we're vertically compressing it by a factor of 3, I know the a value is going to involve a 3. The question is, is it going to be a 3 or is it going to be a 1 third? It should be a 1 third. Very good. 1 third. Because it's exactly as it would appear. And now we have parentheses. So if you see the 1 third, you say, oh, it's a third as tall. It's not as tall. It's 1 third as tall. So it's not as tall. How did it get not as tall? We must have compressed it by a factor of whatever the reciprocal of that number is. The reciprocal of a third is 3. Okay, and then we have our x. We're on the inside now. So if we're moving at 5 units left, I know it's going to be x plus or minus 5. Which one? Plus, it's the opposite of what it appears. Left is normally negative, but it's inside, so it's opposite. It's to the 5. And then guess what part people were forgetting to do when this was a quadratic? It's the step that they're going to forget to do now. Hopefully not. Put the 3 there. Yeah. Don't forget the exponent of 3. That's what makes it a cubic function instead of a linear function. Don't forget the 3. That makes it cubic. Okay. And then vertically down two units, so that's my k value. Is it negative 2 or positive 2? Negative 2. Very good. So now my inflection point, my IP, I'm going to abbreviate inflection point IP. I'll do that over here, IP. Your inflection point is at where? Negative 5? Negative 2. Guess what we're going to do? Let's go ahead and sketch this dude. Let's go ahead and sketch this puppy. For the sketch, we just need an x-axis and a y-axis, so it looks something like that. And the first thing we do is the same thing we would do if this were a parabola. We're going to go to negative 5, negative 2. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There's negative 5. Negative 2 is right here. And we're going to put the dot. But now instead of being a, a, a vertex and drawing it going opening up or down, we know that the domain and range are all real numbers. So unless you reflected it across the x-axis, David, David Meyer, unless you reflected it across the x-axis, it's going to have the same shape that this one does. The only thing that's going to change the shape is if you reflect it across the x-axis, it's now going to be decreasing. That's negative x cubed. We don't have to worry about that. So all I got to do is draw my cubic coming like this. It's coming in here, and it goes horizontal there. So when you're drawing this, Make sure it's curving down like a frown and approach that point like it were going to bounce and go back down. You approach it as if it were going to bounce and go back down, but then you say, psych, and then you continue back up, okay? If you approach it like it's going to bounce and turn around, you'll get it to go horizontal right there because what you don't want to do is have it go through that point at a 45-degree angle. That's lazy. You want it to go through that point so that it's horizontal right at that point. So approach like you're going to bounce, and then psych, juke, right? Fake. Uh -uh. Don't blow out your ACL uh -uh, in the process. But you go the other way. And that's it. That's the graph. What I'll be looking for when I have you sketch it is this. Do you have your inflection point in the right place? Does it change curvature there, and does it go horizontal there? Layla, yours... It changes curvature past that point. You see how yours? So, again, pretend like this is a parabola. When you draw this initially, pretend like it's a parabola. Like you're going to come in here and you're going to bounce and go back down. Okay? But instead of going back down, what are you going to do? Psych! And you're going to curve upward. Draw it like it's going to be a parabola. But then go up the other way. Psych it out. All right. If you draw like this, if you draw like this, guess what? Are you going to get full credit? No, because I'm placing your inflection value right about there instead of where it's supposed to be. Okay? So I'm just going to be looking. Does it change curvature there? Go horizontal, 
go horizontal. Make sure the curvature changes there. All right, so we want to be a little bit more deliberate when we draw these things, right? A little more careful. All right, example two. Now we're given the equation. If f of x is two times the quantity x minus seven cubed, there's my parent function x cubed plus one, write the function for g of x if that graph is translated left two and down four. Okay, so now we're starting with f of x. Let's go ahead and sketch f of x. Where's the inflection point for f of x, the IP? Seven, one. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. There we go. There's the inflection point. And it's a positive two, so it looks something like this. Go horizontal and then go up. Looks like that. That's f of x. All right, now, it says we want to write an equation for g of x if we take the graph of f, translate it left two units. So if I'm going left two units, the 7 is going to go where? To the 5. And then down 4, the 1 is going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, down to negative 3. So now it's going to look like this. And let's see if we can get the equation then. So g of x, did we change the fact that it's still vertically stretched by a factor of 2? Did it say to change that? No, so that's still a 2. But now instead of x minus 7, it should be x minus 5. And instead of plus 1, it should be minus 3. Now that's one way to get the new equation. What way was that? Sketch the original and physically move that inflection point by counting uh, however many spaces left, right, up, and down that you need to go, and then insert that new inflection point, which was at 5, negative 3, insert it back into your new equation. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is this. If we're going left two units, I know that is the inside, all I got to do is add two units to the inside because we're doing the opposite, correct? So left is normally subtract. But because it's inside, it's opposite, and that gives you x negative 7 plus 2 is x minus 5. And then if we're going down 4 units, that is subtracting because it's exactly as it would appear, right? So 1 minus 4 is negative 3, and then you just bring that down there, and you get that. So that's the way to do it analytically. You don't even have to think about what the original graph looks like. Just change the values that you're staring at inside your equation. Just remember, if it's inside, you do the opposite, and if it's outside, you do what it's asking, okay? Good? Two thumbs up. If we had a third thumb somewhere, we'd have three thumbs up, and we'd be in the circus. The three-thumbed, the, the sign would say, come see the three-thumbed Algebra 2 student. That's what it would say. All right. I will write a polynomial function based upon the given characteristics. That's your I will for the day. We will describe the various characteristics of a polynomial. Okay. Okay. We can describe the characteristics. Write the range if the cubic function x cubed, which is our parent function, what if we restrict the domain from negative 2 inclusive up to but not including 3? Interesting, interesting. Whenever we apply cubic models to real life situations, we typically restrict the domain because the situation that we're modeling in the real world may not apply for all real numbers, negative infinity to infinity. It may only work from negative two to three, like we have a stopwatch and we're going two seconds backwards and three seconds forward, right? So we wanna know what the outputs are affected. So here's what I would do first. Step one, I'm gonna graph X cubed. It looks like this, it goes horizontal, and then it comes up. When you draw it, try to draw it with origin symmetry. It should go up to the right at the same curvature that it comes in from the bottom left. And make sure that the inflection point is at the origin. All right, now I'm restricting it from negative two to three. So negative two might be right here. So I'm going from this value to one, two, three, to this value here. So I, I only want to know what this red portion of the graph is doing. 
What is this red portion of the graph doing? Well, I need to know this y value, and I need to know this y value, because it lasts for the range. So once I realize what I'm doing, it shouldn't be a difficult task, should it? The lowest y value we get at negative 2 is just the function value at negative 2, which I find the function value by plugging in. Right, Thomas? What's negative 2 cubed? Negative 8, right? So that's negative 8 right there. That should be a negative 8. Let's see if I can squeeze it in there. Negative 8. I got it. And then if I go all the way out to 3, it should be the function value at 3. Well, if I plug it in, what's 3 cubed? 3 times 3 times 3? No, that's 3 plus 3 plus 3. 3 times 3 plus 3 times 3 is 9. 9 times 3 is 27. So what's 3 cubed? 27. Okay. So this graph spans vertically from negative 8 to 27. What did I do? I just went f of negative 2 to f of 3. That's all I did. And now I need to worry about whether I include it or not include it. Well, f of negative 2 was negative 8. And f of 3 was 27. But now I put y epsilon instead of x epsilon. Okay, so this actually should be x epsilon up there. And, of course, when I write my final answer, I put y epsilon. And there it is. So did we really need the graph for that? No. Did the graph help us understand what we were doing? For sure, yeah. So now that you know what it, why it works, just say, oh, if we're starting at negative 2, my y value is f of negative 2. If we're starting at 3, it's f of 3. Now, be careful. These numbers were in increasing order automatically. If f of negative 2 would have been 27, and f of 3 would have been negative 8, I would have had to have flipped it around. Okay? Does that make sense? Because when we list it as an interval, we always go from least to greatest. But it's not always true, especially with a transformed graph. If I flipped it across the x-axis, it's now a decreasing function. So the bigger numbers are found to the left, and the smaller numbers are found to the right. Okay? So make sure that this is least to greatest at the end. Least to greatest. Okay. The questions on example three. Kingsley, you getting all this? You think she's getting it? You getting all this? You sure? Okay, I'm gonna trust you. A hundred on Wednesday. A hundred on the quiz. We're taking a quiz on Friday. Yeah. So here's what this week looks like. We'll do we'll do seven one today or so yeah seven one today and tomorrow seven two Wednesday Thursday quiz on Friday. Review a week from today on Monday and test next Tuesday. So a week from tomorrow is already your test. There's only two sections in Chapter 7. Yay. All right. Identify the end behavior for f of x equals x minus 4q plus 5 after it's reflected across the x-axis. You see it's all caps and bold. All caps means yell. All caps bold means yell like you're on fire. Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and sketch f of x before it's reflected across the x-axis. Where is the inflection point? IP at, where is the inflection point? Four, is it positive five or negative five? Is it plus five? Positive five. So it's the opposite on the inside, so positive four. Exactly on the outside, so four, five. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. There it is. And you take that and you it approach like you're going to bounce and go down. And then psych, you cruise up. There's what f of x looks like. Now, what would that look like if we reflected across the x-axis? This part here would look like this. Yes, yes. And then it would look like this. And then it would look like that. Where's the new inflection point? The new inflection point should, the x value should still be x equals 4, right? But instead of being positive 5, it reflected down to negative 5. Okay, it looks like that. But really, this question is just asking for the end behavior. So all we got to do is fill in the blanks. But now that we have the graph, the end behavior is easy. 
as x goes to which one do you want to do first? We have the option of doing negative infinity or positive infinity first. Let's do negative infinity. Let's let's just do it from left to right. So as x goes to negative infinity, and then we'll do this one as x goes to positive infinity. You can just plug those in first, and then you can answer the question. We can always do negative infinity first, positive infinity second, or any order. It doesn't really matter. But let's do it left to right. So what would the left end behavior be? As x goes to negative infinity, what are the y values doing? Are they go We're looking at the green graph now. Let me highlight it. As I go out to the left, that's what negative infinity means. My y values are going up, aren't they? Up means positive infinity. Better that? D. And as x goes to positive infinity, which means as we go out to the right, my y values are going down, which means negative infinity. So they switched, right? That's all that happened is they switched. It used to be positive infinity, positive infinity, negative infinity, negative infinity. Now we reflected it across the x-axis. It switched. They're opposite. Negative is now positive. Positive is now negative. Is that going to be the case every time it's reflected? Yeah, it should be. If it's not reflected, it's always positive infinity, positive infinity for the right-hand behavior, negative infinity, negative infinity if it's not reflected. If it is reflected, it's always going to be this. The end behaviors are always going to be the same. The inflection value will be at a different place, and it might be steeper or less steep depending if we're stretching it vertically or compressing it, but the end behaviors will always be opposite if it's reflected across the x-axis. So this gives you the answer to any question when it's reflected across the x-axis, right? It's the same answer. Nifty, neato, mosquito. So good so far? So far so good? How are we doing on time? Plenty of time? Plenty of time. We got to 11:30. That's 14 minutes. Yeah, let, let's let's scroll down here. We got we got we got one more to go. Example five. If the cubic function x cubed, so we're starting with papa, with a mother function. I'll just say mother function. With the mother function x cubed, you mother function. Kind of fun to say. With the given reference points, if it's shifted. Now, it shifted means it can be left, right, up, or down. We're just keeping the same shape, no dilation, no reflections either. We're just shifting it so that the new equation is that. What are the new reference points? Oh, we did this with pollen, with quadratics, didn't we? We did this with quadratics quite a bit. All we got to do is remember this. For the plus 4, for the inside, what do we have to do to any x value? Yeah, for any x value, we're going to subtract 4. That's what we're going to do for any x value. For any y value, what are we going to do? We have to do two things. Does the order matter? I have to multiply by negative 3 and then subtract 2. We do exactly as it says. Does the order matter? Can I subtract 2 and then multiply by negative 3? What is your dear Aunt Sally going to say about that? Don't eat so much turkey, you turkey. She's also going to say to multiply before you add, right? And excuse me. Excuse me, she says. So we're going to have to multiply by negative 3. Then, in all caps, subtract 2. So the x is easy because we're only doing one thing to the x. There's no dilation on the x. So you just do the opposite of what it says. But for the y value, you got to look to see if there's an a value. You have to do the a value first, and then you do the k value. All right. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, we have our we have our method now. So if if we start with negative one and we're adding four, what's negative one plus four? Thank you. Yeah. We simply subtract. Oh, I oh yeah, I, I added four. That's what I I did, but I did the wrong thing, didn't I, Caden? What did I just tell myself I needed to do? I need to tell myself I need to subtract four. And here I go thinking about turkey. And I added four. You got to stay in the zone. Auto zone. Yeah, don't be thinking about auto zone either. If you stay in the math zone. Subtract four and we get negative five. You know what? Putting three there would be a good answer choice on the test, wouldn't it? For someone who actually adds four instead of subtracts four. That's negative five. 
Now, let's do two things to the y value. Let me review for myself. Multiply it by negative 3 and then subtract 2. Okay, so what's negative 1 times negative 3? Three? 3. And then I have to subtract 2 and I get what? 1. So guess where that new point tracked? It went from negative 1, negative 1 to negative 5, positive 1. Orale. Now, we could do the same thing to 0, 0. But we should already know where zero, zero goes, right? Let's see if it, if it works. Zero, zero, which was the original inflection point, should go to the new inflection point. Just by looking at the equation, what should the new inflection point be? Negative four, negative two. Let's see if we get the same answer by doing our little technique that we did here. To the x value, I'm going to subtract four. So zero minus four gives us negative four, and that gives us the x value. To the zero, I'm going to multiply by negative three. 0 times negative 3 is 0, and then I'm going to subtract 2. 0 minus 2 is negative 2. Did it work? Yeah. The little green and red notes that I wrote here, they work for any point. Always subtract 4 from your x value. Always multiply by 3 and subtract 2 for your y value. But for the 0, 0 point, we can do it a different way, just because we know the standard transformation form. Doesn't matter how you do it. All right, go ahead and do 1-1 one, one on your own. I'm going to do 1-1 one, one on my own, and we'll compare answers. Then you mark and set, go. Did we get the same answer? Negative 3, negative 5? I hope so. So I took my 1, which was the x value. I subtracted 4. 1 minus 4 is negative 3. That's my new x value. My old y value of 1, I multiplied by negative 3 to get negative 3. Then I subtracted 2, and I got negative 5, and there's my y value. Now, all we have to do to make sure we get full credit is to make sure that that ordered pair is set off in what type of notation? Parentheses. Some people like just leave it floating out there. Like they're listing their favorite numbers. My favorite number is negative 3, comma, negative 5, uh, comma, that's all I have. No, you put parentheses around it, and now it's an ordered pair. It shows that they're together. And because, because there's no x epsilon out front, see how the context changes? If I were to put x epsilon out front, that would change the context now to an interval, wouldn't it? Those would both be x values from x equals negative 3 to x equals negative 5. But without the x epsilon in front, it's an x and a y value. That's why when it is an interval and they're both x values, we like to put x epsilon. So it doesn't look like an ordered pair. What would be the domain of that g of x? Let's just write that out. What would be the domain of g of x? All real numbers. What would the range of g of x be, though, if the vertex is at negative 4 or negative 2? <laughs> Pretty easy, right? Hey, one last question. Because we did reflect it across the x-axis, because we did reflect it across the x-axis, what's the right end behavior as x goes to infinity? Negative infinity, right? It's the opposite. And what would be the left end behavior as x goes to negative infinity? Positive infinity. It's opposite end behaviors because we reflected. Yes, I was going to ask that next. Who needs to go to the restroom? Riley does. Okay. Any other questions or restroomers? Yeah. You need to be next? Okay. I think we're done. So guess what? We have two days built in for 7.1. And what typically happens when we finish on day one, that means day two is for? Party time, Charlie Brown's Thanksgiving. No, it's it's for homework. Yeah. So come tomorrow in class ready to work on your homework, and it'll be due on Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. Okay? I'll write that. Homework due Wednesday at 9 a.m. All right. Any comments or questions on cubics? All right. I'll go ahead and activate the homework for those of you who want to start it early.